Heavenly Father, make us capable and able to serve the needs of those you bring. Uh, Give us a, a vision, a desire to reach more as you appoint. But don't let us take our vision and put it in place of yours and seek for externals rather than internals to please the world rather than to please you. Hold us, Father, to the values that were behind the beginning of this so that we never lose sight of it. And most of all, Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus, for whom all this is for, by, through, and of. And we thank you, Father, for the word that he spoke and inspired in others to write so that we would understand things that were hidden from the distant past and concern things of our distant future and speak to the purpose and meaning of why we exist. Give us a sober heart, a serious mind, and an open heart as we study tonight, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As our name implies, we're going verse by verse through the book of the Gospel of Matthew. And over the past few weeks, we've been studying through the Sermon on the Mount, which is principally chapters 5 through 7. I was thinking about this as I studied this week. It probably took Jesus, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes to deliver the Sermon on the Mount. But as you can tell, it's taking me considerably longer to understand and explain it to you. But I guess that's to be expected, right? We should be taking our time. Last week, we ended in chapter 20. And at that point, Jesus had told the crowd that if they expected to enter heaven by following the examples of their religious leaders, the Pharisees, well, they better think again. Jesus said, you can't reach heaven merely by equaling the Pharisees' righteousness. Because as scrupulous as those men were in keeping the law and the traditions and so on, they were not good enough to get into heaven. Now, a person, Jesus said, had to exceed the righteousness of a Pharisee in order to enter the kingdom. And as we learned last week, that's true for two reasons. First, the Pharisees just weren't as righteous as they appeared. They were, in fact, a study in style over substance. These were guys who were hypocrites, but they portrayed themselves to be perfectly righteous. And yet they were far from it. So a Pharisee wasn't the example to follow because he wasn't even close to the standard. And that's the second reason we learned that you can't follow a Pharisee into heaven. Because if you want to enter heaven, you have to exceed not the standard of a Pharisee, but you have to get to the standard of God himself. That's the problem. A Pharisee is not an accurate standard because the actual standard to enter heaven, the standard that God will actually use when he judges those who face him without his son's righteousness, the standard he uses is his son's own perfection. That's the standard. You have to exceed the righteousness of a Pharisee because you have to equal the righteousness of Jesus, and his righteousness is a lot higher than that of a Pharisee. So the real standard entered into heaven is absolute perfection, which is much tougher than saying I'm going to be like another sinful human being. Now, you and I cannot meet the standard that I just described. You can't. We can't because we're not perfect. If you have ever sinned, even once then you are already below the standard that God sets for entry into heaven. And if anyone is sitting there wondering, I wonder if I'm actually that good or not. Have you ever lied? You know, they always say that the moment you think you're good enough to enter heaven, you've already sinned at that point because you're lying to yourself. You and I know, and I'm sure most, if not everyone in this room, would have told me this in the beginning. We can't enter heaven on our own merit because we need to be perfect and we're not perfect. So that's why we need Jesus to do it for us. But let's be honest. There are a lot of well-intentioned and religious people. Many of them sitting in churches with crosses on the top of the building at, you know, on Sunday mornings who have never understood this truth. And I know that for a fact because I used to be one of them. And I know people even now in my family, among others, who are still in that unfortunate condition. And that's certainly going to be true back in Jesus' day as well. There wasn't a cross on the building. It was a different symbol. But there were people going into synagogues or into the temple who thought they were on their way to heaven and were oblivious to the truth. So let's go back in time once more, back to the moment that Jesus is preaching here on the Sermon of the Mount. And I want to put yourself back in the crowd again. We did this last week, if you remember. So once again, imagine yourself a typical Jew in Jesus' day. That is to say, you're the kind of person who's committed to pleasing God. Uh, You do your best to observe the law according to the instructions of the Pharisees. You've been taught from your earliest days that, in fact, the Jewish people have an inside track to heaven because you're God's chosen people. And therefore, the kingdom was promised to you in those covenants that God spoke to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, and so on. And as a result, you live with this expectation that your Jewishness is largely all you need to get into heaven. 
You follow the Pharisees' rules for another reason entirely. You do that because they tell you that the more you follow the Mishnah, their rules, the more you are assured a good place in the kingdom when you get there. And now you have Jesus on the mount saying, No, I'm sorry, you've been lied to. That's not good enough. In fact, not even the Pharisees themselves are going to enter the kingdom. And of course you think to yourself, that can't be right. I'm a good Jew. I haven't killed anyone. I haven't committed adultery. Why do we always run to those examples, by the way? Isn't that convenient? But you might say to yourself, well, it's better than that. Not only do I not do those things, I give to the temple. I I keep all the, the dietary restrictions. I mean, surely God is pleased with me. You know, that'd be today, like, you've ever heard someone say, I'm a good Catholic? Now, I was raised Catholic, so I speak from a little bit of personal experience in this regard. You know, there's, there's people who say, I'm a good Catholic. I don't know what that really means. When you really think about it, what does that mean a bad Catholic is? What is the difference? I mean, they're still using the word Catholic, or a good Mormon, or, you know, in fact, you'll hear this too, I'm a good Baptist. Remember? I haven't killed anyone. I go to church on Sundays. I give my tithe. I don't drink, smoke, or chew, or dance with the girls who do, or whatever they say. I don't know how the saying goes. Look, I'm making it a little fun because it's, it's human nature, right? It's not a denominational issue. Some of those groups I mentioned, like Mormons, they're not Christian anyway. But what I'm saying is, whether you're a religious person of a Christian sort or some other sort, we all have this same sense in our head that says, we're okay, aren't we? You know, the ultimate criteria. I'm not Hitler, as if only Hitler is in hell. In that kind of thinking, you find one of the dangerous consequences of Pharisaic Judaism or of any of these other modern equivalents. And here's what I mean. Here's the the dangerous consequence of their thinking. You grade yourself on the curve. In terms of a spiritual merit of where you think you stand with God, you grade yourself on the curve instinctively. Obviously, there's another group of society that could not care less about God or religion or anything to do with it, and they will just ignorantly walk into their judgment. But among those who take some interest in religion and practice it and do so according to a set of rules of some sort, as the Jews did in the following of their Mishnah, they always rig the game in their favor. It's just natural. It's human nature to emphasize the rules that you can follow and to either ignore or eliminate the ones that you can't or don't want to follow. And so it's a selective kind of obedience. And in that way, you get to tell yourself, I'm righteous, but in reality... You're simply doing what you prefer and calling it righteousness. When we looked at that topic last week, we noticed that, for example, in the Mishnah, there was a rule prohibiting the combining of meat and dairy in Jewish kosher law. And I mentioned last week about how that restriction grew out of the law that God gave in Exodus to Israel that prohibited the Canaanite idolatrous practice of boiling a a baby goat in its mother's milk. That, in other words, the religious leaders of Israel had perverted God's purposes by inventing new rules that had nothing to do with the underlying concern that God had of idolatry. And as a result, their new rules just obscured God's intent rather than reinforcing it. Why did that happen? Here's why. Because abstaining from idolatry is tough. It's hard. It requires disciplining the flesh. It requires that we remain faithful to God. And those things are not easy to do, not necessarily. But by comparison, you know, it's a lot easier not to eat a cheeseburger. So which is harder, being faithful to God or just abstaining from a certain kind of food? That's what comes out of this kind of selective righteousness. So while an Orthodox Jew today will not eat a cheeseburger, many of them do engage in idolatrous practices of one kind or another. And that's the problem. It's called moving the goalposts. We contrive a set of rules that we know we can successfully meet, and in that way we declare victory and we assume that God's happy with us. Religious thinking like that leads you to feeling righteous without actually being righteous. And sadly, that's what happens to many religious people. They die in their sins, and they wake up the next instant surprised to find themselves facing eternal punishment. They thought their system of rules would get them to heaven. And Jesus says, if you want to enter heaven, you have to meet a standard, yes. But you have to meet God's standard, not the one you invent for your own or that someone else invented for you. And God's standard is this. Be as good as Jesus. Equal the glory of God. As we learned last week, that's what Jesus said was expected. And as we're going to learn today, 
That standard is tougher than it sounds. I mean, if I haven't made it sound tough enough, it's actually worse than that. Because God's law required that you not only obey in these actions, these behaviors, but you have to obey perfectly in your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Your words, your thoughts, not just your actions, your motives, your attitudes have to agree perfectly with God in every circumstance of your life. So if you tell me right now you've never done anything wrong, have you even had a bad attitude? I bet you do now. I bet it's coming, isn't it? That's the problem. And that's why Jesus said, you have to exceed the example of the Pharisees. And to help us see how this standard will be applied, he gives us now at the, uh, as the rest, basically, of chapter 5, where we are now and all the way to the end, he gives us six examples, six examples that demonstrate how demanding God's standard of perfection truly is. And in other words, when Jesus said your righteousness must exceed the Pharisees, here's what he meant. Beginning in verse 21, he says, You have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So, that's the first of these six. And Jesus opens each of these six with the phrase, you have heard it said. In fact, if you just glance down your your page of your Bible there, or your screen, you'll notice verses 21, 27, 31, 33, 38, 43. Those are your six Examples each begins with the same phrase. This phrase is important because it's a customary rabbinical way of saying the oral law. In other words, you said this phrase as a rabbi directly before you quoted from the Mishnah. Having said you have heard, heard refers to hearing something spoken, referring to the oral law. As a contrast, for example, you notice in the New Testament, whenever an author quotes from the Old Testament, how do they begin that quote? As it is Written. That's a reference to written scripture, or in our case, actual scripture. So if a rabbi was quoting from the oral law, they would say, as you have heard. If they quoted from the written law, they said, as it is written. So each of these six examples are Jesus not quoting necessarily from what scripture says, but quoting from what the law of the Pharisees was, what the Mishnah, what the rules of the day were as developed by Pharisees. And in the six examples that Jesus chooses... He chooses some of the most challenging, and I would argue, even some of the most offensive rules in the law of God. And the first of these, now, as you see, concerns the sixth commandment of do not commit murder. Now, what the Mishnah did is it took law that was in the written word of God, and then it elaborated on it. So here you see it starting with the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit murder. And in the case of murder, what the Mishnah went on to say was that a person is guilty of violating this commandment, when they are found liable by a court. That's what a Pharisee said. You are guilty of violating the Sixth Commandment when a court says you have committed murder. And that you could not be considered to have violated the commandment unless you were duly convicted by the court. Now, that's the oral law that Jesus quotes in verse 21. And it makes a lot of sense to us, right? A Jew who killed another person was not guilty of murder unless a rabbinical court had convicted that person. And our own law works the same way today, right? Here's the mistake, though. Is that the way God works? You see, you're making an assumption there. You're assuming that God respects our local court system. And if the local court, for whatever reason, acquits you, God's cool with that. Or, if you never get to a trial because no one ever realizes that you did it, no one even knows the crime existed, well, we're okay. Now, that seems silly in some ways, right? We should know better. But let me tell you, that's the rabbinical mind. That's how Jews were taught. That's the oral law. This example exposes how following a man-made rule like that, like the Mishnah's view of murder, gives you a false sense of security. And this is so typical for us in all cases, whether it's at school or at work or in religion. If someone gives us a list and says, here's what you have to do to be successful, we love that, right? We're all over that. We got it. And if someone does it in terms of religion, hey, Steve, here's what you have to do to go to heaven. Okay, I got this. 
Because now I can work the plan, right? We take the checklist, we work the plan, and we assume we can do it well enough to get into heaven. Once again, though, we rig the game. Because we're following rules that we like. Or we're defining our success in ways that support our own abilities, you know? We're only as good as we need to be. You, in fact, could accomplish everything on any list that I give you and still be disqualified from heaven in the end. Because when it comes to entering heaven, the only established standard that matters is the one God establishes. And so, if your list of rules for getting into heaven doesn't look exactly like the same list God uses when he judges you, then your list is worthless. And you have no security. Well, guess what? The Mishnah is not God's rule book. And in verse 22, Jesus explains that. He says, God's standard for whether you have kept the sixth commandment or not is a little different. First, he agrees that taking someone's life is unlawful. He's not saying it isn't. But just because you haven't killed someone yet, that does not mean you are qualified to get into heaven. Jesus says, you have to keep not just the letter of the law, but you also have to keep the spirit of that law. And the spirit of the sixth commandment goes a lot deeper than simply murdering. Jesus says meeting the requirements of thou shalt not murder also includes not expressing any anger unrighteously toward another person, not even speaking a word against them. Even just calling someone a fool, Jesus said, is enough cause for you to be brought under the condemnation of the sixth commandment. That's God's standard. That's his rule book. And it's a lot higher than anything the Pharisees provided. You're learning that righteousness goes a lot deeper than just actions. It includes attitudes. It includes thoughts. Uh, Said another way, the measure of your righteousness is found inside you, not merely outside in your actions. So long before you think to raise your hand against someone and take their life, you harbored some animosity in your heart toward that person. You had to. And as you thought those thoughts, as you spoke those words against them, as you entertained the concept of taking their life... Your sin preceded your action. The act of taking their life was just the last link in a chain of sin that led up to that violent moment. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, obviously, a few of us in this room have taken another person's life, I'm assuming, in violation of that commandment. So if I was to ask this crowd, have you ever committed murder? I'm, I'm assuming I'd see little or no hands go up. Nevertheless, according to Jesus, every single person in this room is guilty of violating that commandment. I'm not saying everyone's murdered. I'm saying you're guilty of it in spirit, if not in literal truth. Not because you killed anyone, because you're equally guilty for hating someone or saying something against them. Now, you start to get the point right away that this standard for heaven, it's pretty tight. You know, there's no curve here. It's all or nothing. Notice at the end of verse 22, Jesus says, violating the spirit of the law is enough to cast you into the fiery hell. You know, he doesn't want you to think that maybe there's some kind of like point system. Like, you know, when you lose your license after you get too many tickets, it's not like you get a couple of free kills on your way into hell. Right? Just saying, you fool, you're in hell. That's it. That's done. You don't even, it doesn't even matter what you do after that. That's the standard for entering heaven. One sin is enough to bar you from heaven. So if you assumed you're going to heaven because you've never killed anyone, think again. When you go to hell and you meet true murderers in hell, like Hitler or Stalin, you're going to say to them, well, at least I never committed murder like you. Well, guess what? You're just as hot as they are. You're just as uncomfortable as they are. That's the literal truth. You cannot get to heaven following the oral law. You have to do better. You have to understand God's standard, which is Jesus. So if that's us... That is to say, if we're somebody who has come to recognize that I've been working off of the wrong standard, you know, the old scale in the sky thing that people sometimes refer to, that, you know, on balance, I'm pretty good. As long as I'm better than most, as long as I've got more good than bad. I don't know where we came up with that, but somehow that's the standard we'd like to think. There's people out there living with that mindset. Jesus wants you to understand that's not going to work. And he gives you two illustrations to follow this first example. The two illustrations come in 23 through 26. Look what he Says He says, therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. 
Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. All right, there are two illustrations here. In the first one, Jesus describes a worshiper who's gone to the temple. He's preparing to make an offering to God. And while he's there, suddenly he remembers that he has a fellow Jew, or in this terminology, a brother, who has something against him. Now, that means at some point, this in the past, previously, at some point, this worshiper offended that Jew, his brother. And yet, for whatever reason, he's never reconciled. He's never repaired that relationship. In effect, what he did when he offended that brother is he broke the sixth commandment. He didn't kill anyone, but what he did is a violation of the spirit of the law. Jesus is point. And then he says, the worshiper's heart is convicted in the moment as he approaches in the temple. And in his conviction, he realizes, you know, um, I have a sin that stands between me and God. My own conscience is made clear to me. That offense against my brother is a problem that I need to deal with. Now, what's interesting about his illustration is there's nothing in the law that says that's a problem. And there's nothing in the Mishnah that says this is a problem. Jesus is listing something here that no one in Jewish teaching had ever said was a problem. But the man's conscience told him it was a problem. His actions had put him in violation of the spirit of the commandment. And so rather than coming before God with this guilt, the worshiper leaves to go make things right. And after that, he could again come back to God. Because after all, if this guy had killed somebody literally, he's not going to go from murdering someone to walking into the temple and then expecting that God's going to be pleased with him, right? He knows better than that. No more then should he expect to seek God's approval if he's offended his brother, because it's a sin as well. That's Jesus' point. So having set aside his sacrifice and having reconciled with his brother, then he can return and then he can approach God with a clear conscience. What's the point of the illustration? That you don't need a Mishnah. You don't need a rule book to understand what righteousness requires. Your own conscience will convict you of sin. And those who would then rest on some technicality and some rule book that they like to cling to and ignore their conscience when they know that they're not doing what God wants, well, they better be prepared to face the judge one day. And that's the second illustration. In verse 25, he describes now a situation where there's two people involved in a legal dispute. One of them is dragging the other one to court over this matter. And in the illustration, Jesus puts you and I, the audience, in the place of the one being sued. Did you notice that? And it's clear from the illustration, we're guilty. We're guilty of the charge. The one that's dragging us to court is on the right side of the law. And we're on the wrong side. And so Jesus is saying to us, if you know you're guilty of the crime, you ought to act responsibly and sensibly to resolve the situation before you get to the court. Don't keep denying Don't keep making excuses. Don't perpetuate the dispute. Don't stand in your prideful stubbornness over the whole thing. Because what happens if you do that? Ultimately, he says, if you don't resolve the situation with the one you offended, you will end up in court. And in court, a judge who sees the facts correctly will render a judgment against you. And since you're truly at fault, you're going to end up paying the price of your mistake. That's not a good outcome. The better outcome would be to resolve it ahead of time with the person, reconciling with them before you meet the judge, because it's a lot better to work it out with that person than it is to face a merciless judge who is going to hold you to the letter of the law. Can you see the point of the illustration? His point is that true righteousness begins with an understanding that you are guilty, that you have a problem, so that even when you're busy following a little rule book, Thinking you're righteous, your conscience is still there telling you, no, you're not, no, you're not, you're not perfect, you've got problems. And if you persist in this little game of convincing yourself that the rules you're following are good enough for God, what's going to happen? Sooner or later, you die. Sooner or later, you stand before the one who is actually going to hold you accountable, who actually has the right standard, who is actually the judge. And in that illustration, you notice... There were these two men involved in the dispute. So the reconciliation that had to take place was one guy going to the other guy and working it out. That was the illustration. But when you apply it to the real situation, to us and God, who have we offended? God. So who do we have to reconcile with? God. In real life, that's who the reconciliation has to be with. We're talking about reconciling with God. He is not only our judge, he is also our adversary if we don't get right with him. So you have to make peace with him. If you don't, you pay the full price of your sin. So how do you reconcile with God? 
How do you make friends with God? You know, the answer in the Scripture is pretty straightforward. You can't, not on your own, but Jesus did. That in other words, the Bible says, if we accept his work on our behalf, if we repent of our sin and acknowledge it such that we understand we need someone to fix our problem for us, then Christ comes in and solves it for us. When you place your faith in Christ, you're accepting his gift of a perfect life in place of your sinful life. And by your faith, you're given credit for his perfection. And God accepts his death on the cross as payment for your sin. Paul says it this way in Romans 5.10. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's what we're talking about in this illustration. Don't go headstrong into your judgment moment thinking you're somehow going to come out on top when you know your conscience tells you you've got a gap. You've got a a shortcoming. We're not good enough to get in on our own. Now, with the time remaining, I want to look briefly at the second example that he gives us here. In Matthew 5, 27. So the first example was, you've heard it said, don't murder. Let me tell you what the real standard is. And then he gave some illustrations to emphasize, here's what you should be thinking. Second example, verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, again, from the Mishnah, he says, you have heard. And this time, of course, the mission is teaching on the seventh commandment is in view, that is, of not committing adultery. Once again, the mission's definition constitutes a starting point from Scripture, but then it moves beyond Scripture and falls short of what God expects. The, the Pharisees had said, look, this is when you're violating the seventh commandment. When a married man has sexual relations with a woman who's not his wife. That's when you have committed adultery. If you do that, then you are guilty of the violation of the commandment. If you have not done that, then you are not guilty of the commandment. Now, again, it seems very sensible, right? It seems very cut and dry. The problem is, what makes sense to us is not necessarily what God does. And what God does does not necessarily make sense to us. We have to be informed from His Scripture. And what God says in the Word is, my standard for uh, keeping the seventh commandment is a lot loftier than what you think it is. Jesus says the commandment also covers lustful glances. You just look at someone with lust. Bam, that's a violation of the seventh commandment. Lust is not equal to adultery. I'm not saying that if you've lusted, you've committed adultery. I'm saying if you've lusted, you've broken the seventh commandment. And if you've committed adultery, you've also broken the seventh commandment. They're both violations. One is of literal requirement. The other is of the spirit of the law. But they're both equally sin. So once more, I think I could take a poll in here of how many people have committed adultery. and you know, maybe, maybe a few honest hands might go up. But if I asked how many people in here have violated the seventh commandment, every single hand in this room should go up. Unless maybe you're three or or six, I don't know. So in other words, here's again the danger of following man-made rules. Even ones that are supposedly built on the Bible. You know, you would never have looked at the Mishnah's requirements about adultery and and thought that it was off, right? It's founded on what God wrote in, in Exodus chapter 20, thou shalt not. The problem is it didn't understand how deep that goes. Inevitably, when you stick to something that is an abstraction of God's word rather than the full meaning of it, you contrive it in a way that gives yourself an unfair advantage and a false sense of security. It's, once again, it's really, in relative terms, it's really easy to avoid an act of adultery. I mean, it's not like you're just going to fall into it accidentally. You know, you, it's not like it's that easy to go out and do it. You have to make an effort at it, relatively speaking. But how hard is it to have a moment? A glancing look, a thought. You know, those are the kind of moments that by the time you recognize you're in sin, it's too late. You know, you always say to yourself, I shouldn't have done that. You never say to yourself, I will not do it. I didn't. I don't. <laughs> I mean, who thinks like that, right? It's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Too late, man. You're in hell. That's it. Done. You know, see what my point is? You can't avoid it because it's in your nature. So once more, Jesus uses two illustrations to to emphasize what we should do with this truth. Verse 29, he says, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it away. Throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Pretty provocative, isn't it? Jesus says, Jesus says, 
It's better for you to pluck out your eye rather than to allow that eye that, to then lead you into a lusting moment. That's in the context of adultery here, of course. Or he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off rather than to be found in sin. And without being vulgar, I can tell you that in Jewish culture, the right hand was a, a term that could be used for a euphemism. It stood at times for that unique male body part associated with adultery. So knowing that he's teaching here in the context of adultery, he's probably referring to that male body part, not to an actual right hand when he speaks here. So he mentions the eye because it's leading you to lust, and he mentioned the other body part because it consummates the lust. All right. So in both cases, what Jesus says is, cut the stuff off from your body if that's the alternative to hell. Now, to understand his illustration, let's make sure we understand what he's not saying. Okay? First of all, he is not advocating the cutting off of body parts. And we know that because it would do nothing to address the problem that he's concerned with. Right? If you were to pluck out your own eye or cut off other body parts, you don't get an automatic pass into heaven. All right? I don't know if that's a confusing thought, but you, it, it's not like that gets you in automatically. Okay? And nowhere does the Bible teach that self-mutilation is a fast pass into heaven. In fact, the Bible says exactly the opposite. You may remember a story about a man named Abraham. Abraham was commanded by God to cut off a certain body part, very similar to the one we're talking about right here. And Paul tells us in Romans that the Lord declared Abraham to be righteous by faith before that moment, before circumcision, so that by Abraham's example, we would know that the removal of that body part had nothing to do with whether he pleased God or not. So clearly, Jesus isn't reversing that here and saying that that's somehow now the way we get in. And the other reason we know he's not advocating it in seriousness is because it wouldn't solve the problem of sin. It doesn't work. You know, if you remove one of my eyes, I'll just lust more with the other one. Take them both out. And I still have my memories. I mean, in other words, there's nothing that's going to prevent my heart from lusting because that's where it is, right? You, you sin in your heart. So even without eyes, even without other body parts, I'm still going to lust. I'm still going to have sin if I choose to let it run in my head, if I choose to let it happen. So it's not a solution. He's not proposing it as a solution. Clearly, his words were intended to be hyperbolic and ironic, not literal. He's illustrating that you and I should be willing to make any sacrifice necessary now if doing so keeps us out of hell later. It's an issue of timing and severity or seriousness. That is to say, if you have not reconciled with God now, then nothing else in your life should take a priority on that issue. Now, you may not like what I'm offering. That is, you may not agree with what the Bible says about how to reconcile with God. Fine. Go figure it out on your own. But you can't sit by at this stage of life knowing what's coming, that is death, and tell yourself, I'll just see how it works out. That's the hugest gamble you could ever make. Why would you do that? Wouldn't you want some assurance? Wouldn't you want to work on the problem now while you have an opportunity to to get it right before that moment comes? That's his point. There is no other issue in your life even close in importance to this question of what happens when I die? What will happen when I face God? Nothing else matters because eternity, friends, is a long, long time. And if you do not reconcile with your adversary before you come before him at your judgment, then the consequences will be devastating, eternal, and irreversible. In fact, if someone is unwilling to do what's necessary to reconcile with God now while they have the opportunity, I would argue they don't understand the jeopardy they are in. That's the only explanation I would have for that person. They don't get it. Of course, the Pharisees were not willing to do what Jesus is advocating right now. They're not willing to reconcile with God. They weren't willing to cut their hand off, so to speak. They weren't willing to cut their eye out. In other words, what he's saying is that emphasize that reconciling with God was not something they put any priority on because in their mind they didn't need it. And they weren't willing to humble themselves before God. Most Pharisees were not willing to sacrifice what was necessary to reach that conclusion. Think about it for a minute. If you were a Pharisee and you start to listen to this teaching, what would you have to agree with in order to follow suit with it? Well, number one, you'd have to agree that your rules aren't sufficient. You'd have to turn your back on your beloved Mishnah. You'd have to then also acknowledge that your performance is not sufficient. 
your piety, your self-righteousness, your position of honor among the people, you would have to step back from that in humility, acknowledging, I'm sorry, I'm not as good as I thought I was. I'm certainly not as good as you think I am. And I know I'm not good enough for God. That's not easy to do. There's people that won't even admit they're wrong when they're talking to their spouse about who left the milk out. Right? There's people who are too prideful to admit anything. I'm not speaking from example in my own house. I'm just saying, generally... We know that this is true in humanity. These guys would have had to turn their back on everything. I think that's at the core of this illustration. That Jesus said you have to do better than even a Pharisee if you want to enter heaven. Not just in their performance, but in their heart. That is, they had to be willing to acknowledge that I'm willing to cut myself off, metaphorically, from anything I value, anything I hold dear. In the case of Pharisees, that would have been their pride, their wealth, their status, their privilege, things that came to them because of the Mishnah, they'd have to have said, it's not what I thought, and I'm not who you thought, and they'd have to have walked away from all of that in order to find the true reconciliation they needed. And they couldn't do it. Now, there were some. There were some Pharisees who did it. You may think of men like Nicodemus, for example. There's one in particular, though, that's most famous for turning away from that pharisaical mindset and embracing the need to reconcile with God. And when he wrote of his experience, this is what he said in Philippians 3, 4. He said, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, which is a way of saying to think themselves better than they are. He says, I far more than others felt that way, paraphrasing. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, And as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, I persecuted the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless, he says. You know who I'm talking about, right? And Paul goes on to say, But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I might gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. All right, so that is what a Pharisee would have to have said in order to reconcile with God. He would have had to turn his back on everything that was a value. So if you're planning to get to heaven by following the Pharisees and their oral law, as a Jew in our little story here, then the question has to come, are you prepared to accept your fate? Are you prepared for God's standard? Because His standard for righteousness is so much more demanding than your rules. You can't afford any miscalculations, by the way. If you've got your rules, whether they're Catholic or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or Hindu or Muslim or whatever you've come up with in your own mind... I'm better than my neighbor. I'm better than, better than Hitler. Whatever you're resting on, you better not miscalculate. You better be sure you're right. Because you can't make a single mistake. Can you succeed against that standard? Are you prepared to remove cherished body parts if necessary to avoid the sin that takes you out of heaven? And search your conscience. Doesn't it convict you right now? Have you been perfect? I know if you've been married, you're not. I know if you're a child, you're not. Right? We all had those moments where we know we got caught. So like the man at the altar, shouldn't we be running to the one we've offended to seek reconciliation before we have to face him as a judge? Shouldn't you be doing it now before you've lost the chance, before you get thrown into the court? Shouldn't we be willing to do whatever is required? Cut ourselves off from whatever is in the way? If hell is on the line? If eternity is the issue? I mean, the answer is really simple for those of us who've already made this turn, right? It seems so obvious. We Don't we all ask ourselves why somebody doesn't do this? You know, if you've ever had a moment to evangelize somebody, a friend, a, a family member, somebody, and they won't come through the conversation, they just can't see it. Isn't it just blowing your mind? You're thinking, this is so simple and profound. How can you not understand this? The truth is that the hearts are hard, and God has to penetrate with this truth. But once he does, and if you're in the room now thinking that, yeah, you know, this is something I should do, the answer is so simple. God has made it so simple because he knew we needed it to be simple. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, the sinless man who died to pay for your sin, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, proving he has the power to grant life over death. And if you do that by your faith, the Bible says Jesus will raise you from the dead. 
And he will live with you forever in the kingdom. No rules, just grace. That's what the gospel offers. That's what Jesus is emphasizing here. We'll come back next week. We'll look through the rest of this chapter at the remaining examples. The theme won't change, not much, but we'll see some new things that aren't uh, in the teaching today. And then we'll move into the next part of his teaching in chapter 6. Let's go to prayer. For anyone in here who has heard what I've said tonight in a new way, perhaps in a way that has opened your heart to the gospel, and perhaps now you're thinking it's time that God is calling you to faith and that this is the moment, I dare ask, do not leave the room without a confession, friends, because you don't know the last day you'll be on this earth. And you also don't know the last day God's going to open his heart, open your heart to hear this message. Don't test him. Respond now. And that response doesn't require you stand up or do anything in front of everybody else. It just requires that you talk to somebody in this room before you leave. And I would hope you either talk to me or someone with those prayer stickers on their chest or one of the leaders in this church who might be standing in the back of the church as we exit today. But if you walk out without talking to someone, you may not talk to anyone. That's why we're here tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that your son died because we don't want to, but we deserve it. We acknowledge in our hearts, Father, that the sin that our conscience convicts us of is real, it's ever-present, and it's heavy on our hearts. For those in here, Father, who have confessed Christ, know him to be their Savior and have come to faith in him, Father, the The weight has been lifted off our hearts. We know that sin is still present, but we don't fear you and we don't feel the crushing weight of our sin because we know it's been put on your son who was crushed for our sake. But there are others, perhaps, Father, in this room who still feel that tug. Perhaps their pride, perhaps their determination not to face these things has kept them from a moment of humility, a moment of confession. I know that moment too, Father. I remember, Father, as you patiently worked in my heart, the days in which I ignored it. But I also remember the day in which, Father, you brought me to a full and complete recognition. And as I confessed, Father, you were there for me. And I thank you, Father, that you asked nothing of us except our submission to this truth. So, Father, for any in this room who are struggling to submit, take take their hearts, Father. Soften them. Speak to them as only you can in love. And explain to them, Father, as only you can, that this is the day of salvation. This is the time and the place you've appointed. And that if they would just humble themselves in the smallest way to confess something they know in their hearts is true, you are faithful and just to forgive them of their sins and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And that in a day to come, Father, they will join with all those in the family of God in a day, in a place of glory, living forever, Father, free of the sin that they know now. For that is what our son, your Son did on the cross, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for that gift, Father, one that we could find no other way. We thank you for the truth of the message of the gospel. We thank you for the courage of those who will confess you today. Father, we thank you for these things because we are nothing without you. But we are everything in you. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.